sure members will want to get away quickly for this afternoon's exciting business. Um, can we have the surrounding and apologies for the pension subcommittee, please? Thank you, Chairman. We have nine members present. Councillor Ronnie currently not present. Councillor Ronnie's apologies. He's in the building, but unfortunately something else has come up. So. Thank you for that. And uh, surrounding and apologies for the pension board, please. Thank you. Uh, four board members present today. Apologies from Karen Hunter, Sheila Smith, and I could advise the subcommittee that the new chair of the pension board is David McKee. Thank you. I'm sure we'd all want to um, congratulate Councillor McKee on, on his appointment there. Um, but before we move on to the, to the other business, I know that other chairs have um, welcomed new members as this committee has a number of new members. We, we maybe don't need to do that so much, but I would like to thank the, the previous chair, Tom McCotchy, um, and I'm sure all members would like to join me in doing so. I was talking to Tom just the other week, who was telling me that he's sat in the pension subcommittee since about 1995, with a gap of about three years in the middle. And uh, I was talking to, to John earlier and just pointed out that I wasn't even born in 1995, so that's uh, a considerable level of service to, to this committee. I'm sure we would all uh, like to thank Tom for that. Um, could we, uh, I know that uh, the next thing is declaration, uh, it's the delegation, but could we move to the declarations of interest first for the pension subcommittee, please? Does any member have any declaration of interest? Thank you. And for the pension board, does any member have a declaration of interest? Thank you. So the first um, item of business is a delegation to pension subcommittee. Obviously, as we're all versed now, it's uh, coming to every committee of the council. Um, and I'll open it up to any questions if members have any. Okay, so are we happy to proceed with the recommendation that to note the remit of the pension, pension subcommittee as detailed in 3.2? Thank you. Okay, and I, next item of business is the overview of the pension fund, and we're going to have a presentation. Hopefully people can hear me. Uh, I have a quite quiet voice, so if you can't hear me, please just uh, give me some sort of polite sign, and I'll try and speak up a little bit louder. Just a brief introduction of myself. My name is uh, Pete Riedel, as it says there on the, on the screen. I work for Hyman's Robertson, who are the actuaries and investment advisors to the Dumfries and Galloway Pension Fund. Been working for Hyman's now for around about uh, 12 years. Previous to that, I was 20 years in local government myself, working down in the south of England, where I was a pension manager of a similar fund down there. The idea of today is to go through a brief introduction of the entire LGPS and how it's worked and how, it, how it's governed. Appreciate that time is short. There's an awful lot of information in the slide pack that you've been given. I don't intend to go through every single slide in absolute detail because I know that the time is short. So this is going to be a very, very much a whistle, whistle stop tour. If anyone has any questions anyway through this, then please do uh, let me know. So this is just to give a brief idea of what I want to cover today, really in three sections. One looking at the legislation around the LGPS and the way the scheme has been set up, then looking at the other two key areas around valuations and investment. And hopefully now we'll interrupt if I say anything wrong on the investment side. So in terms of the legislation, this is to just to give you a bit of context of where the LGPS sits. It doesn't sit in splendid isolation. As a piece of legislation, it, it sets out the rules of the scheme, but sitting above that, you have various pieces of legislation, primary legislation, be it finance acts that deal with pensions and taxation, be it the Sub Public Service Pensions Act that came out in 2013, which deal with, with the overriding governance issues around public service pension schemes, or the wider pensions acts, which deal with sort of wider pensions issues. So they're sitting on the top. The LGPS is sitting underneath that, and everything it does has to comply with that overriding legislation where it applies to the LGPS. And also, you've also got Scottish ministers and the SPCA who deal with 
that sort of uh, strategy and, and direction of the scheme nationally across Scotland. So there's lots of players. That's really what that one is trying to say in terms of what's going on uh, in terms of nationally. Like I say, you've got the different uh, pieces of legislation. That just gives you a bit more detail in terms of what each one will cover. So each one will cover something different, but basically the pension scheme itself has to make sure it complies, as we'll come on to in a minute, in terms of responsibility locally, that falls on the pensions committee to make sure that that is happening. The LGPS itself, uh, you've got two key pieces of legislation. One, the LGPS Scotland Regulations 2014. That's dealing with the membership, the contributions and the benefit structure of the scheme. So that's setting out the rules that apply there. You've then got the Management and Investment of Funds Regulations in 2010. That's dealing with the investment side of things. There's those two separate pieces of legislation. My experience has always been when it comes to pension committees, they've focused very much on the management and investment of funds side of things, which is understandable because that's a big issue. It's just to make, make you aware you're also responsible for the administration of the scheme as well, the day-to-day -day stuff that goes on. So you've got both of those hats to wear. You also have guidance that comes from uh, the centre via SPPA and Scottish ministers. That's just to give you a sense of some of that, that sort of guidance that's out there. You won't necessarily see it in terms of your role and your function, but certainly your pensions team will be looking at that on a daily basis to try and do the day-to-day the -day work that they are doing. So it's quite a complex picture, is what I'm trying to paint, really. The scheme itself, one set of regulations, or two sets of regulations, around investments and, and, and administration, but there's so much else going on as well, and your responsibility is to make sure you understand how some of these pieces fit together, because if it goes wrong, then there'll be people that will be coming sort of after you as the committee uh, to sort of see what was happening in terms of Dumfries and Galloway. So in terms of, the, again, the governance structure of the scheme. Legislation is quite complicated. The governance structure of the scheme is also quite complicated as well. There are so many different people at, at play here. Ultimately, you've got the treasurer at the top at the moment. They're the ones who are pulling the purse strings. They are the ones who are setting that sort of overall policy direction that uh, the Westminster government wants to go in in terms of how the public service pension schemes are going to be financed and run and the sorts of benefits that they want to see being paid out of them. You've then got the responsible authority. These, these are names that have come in as a result of the Hutton Inquiry a few years ago where they introduced uh, the, the Public Service Pensions Act back in 2013. So effectively, the Scottish ministers, they're the people that will set the they send out the legislation. If they want to change the rules of the scheme, they're the ones that put the legislation together. They're the ones that will go out to consultation. And they're, they're the ones who will ultimately take that forward, any, any changes that need to be made. You've got your Scottish Scheme Advisory Board, which is sitting between the two, in terms of Scottish ministers and yourself as a ministering authority. They're there to sort of act as a, a conduit between both parties to make sure that your needs are being addressed, but also the, the needs and desires <coughs> of the... Uh, the Scottish ministers are coming down as well and it's all being controlled. You've also got the public service, Scottish Public Pensions Agency, sorry, who are there providing support and assistance and guidance as well. So they're, they're on, the, on the outside of this. And then you've got uh, uh, an increased responsibility in the last few years for the pensions regulator. Now in the past, the regulator was only concerned with whether or not employee and employer contributions were paid over by the public service schemes or by all the employers in those schemes. They now have a far wider remit in terms of the management of public sector schemes, including all of the LGPS funds in the UK. So that they have a code of practice, code of practice 14. Not the best read, but something if you were going to pick anything up, it would be worth having a look at just to get a sense of some of those responsibilities that they have to make sure that pension schemes are being governed properly. Uh, one of the big ones that they are dealing with over the last few years is around breaches of the law. So, for example, the big one that's been out there recently is annual benefit statements, getting them out late 
because a breach of the law effectively should be reported to the regulator. They let everybody off last year because it was the first year that we went into the care scheme. But this year, they're not going to be quite so, uh, <laughs> so, 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 so kind. So, uh, yeah, the sort of things are uh, sort of changing there. Then you've got, obviously, you've got all the other support from the local government association, provide a lot of guidance and a lot of assistance on, certainly on the administration side. Obviously, you've got the trade unions and the other, and the other bodies, the employer bodies who are interested and have an interest in the scheme want to make sure that they uh, further the, the their, their, their individual parties. Pensions Ombudsman is something, obviously people complain about their scheme, how it's been administered, benefits they've got, any decisions that have been taken, they can ultimately take it to the Ombudsman. All of these things are there just to be aware of the fact that there's this big governance structure at a national level that you need to be sort of thinking of. And then even locally, when you look at it locally, You've got the administering authority that sits at the top, which we call the scheme manager, Dumfries Galloway Council. But then you've also got you've got the committee, you've got your investment subcommittee, you've got your local pension board that is now there to assist with what is going on. You've obviously got your Section 95 officer as well. They've got responsibility for the good management of the finances. So all of these people are playing a part in the overall administration of the scheme. So what seems like a fairly simple sort of yeah, pension scheme, suddenly when you look at it in that local and that national level, you suddenly realise just how complicated the structure that is that has been set up there. And you've got to make sure that you're on top of all of this. Like I say, this is a whistle-stop tour. You can drill down into individual bits of detail here to find out what those responsibilities are if you need to, but this is just to give you a sense of where we are. Thank you yourself, Chair. Uh, it was just on the investment subcommittee um, just to understand for the Friesen Galloway Council as a scheme, do we actually have such a thing or is that included within the... Yeah, okay, thank you. Some people will have it down as a, a set put to one side. Some people incorporate it into it. So this is looking at the sort of the, 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 the breadth of the employers that you can get in your fund as well. So obviously you've got the... the Dumfries and Galloway Council, and you've got uh, police, fire, civilian staff, and colleges. Those employers effectively must admit their employees into the scheme. They can't offer them anything else. Uh, we used to call them scheduled employers, but now everyone's in the same schedule. They're just part one of that schedule within the, the appropriate regulation. You also have uh, another group of employers who may admit employees into the scheme, which we call admitted bodies. We've used a couple of old-fashioned terms here to try and sort of explain the difference between the two. Community admission bodies might be your sort of your, your local charities, local organisations like that. They've got a bit of a link to public sector, may have a link to Dunfrey's Council, may get their funding, whatever. They can decide if they want to allow their employees access to the scheme. Dunfrey's and Galloway Council will then decide with the pension committee whether or not it wants to accept that application and take it forward, it doesn't have to. The fund or the, the administering authority sets the hoops. The admitted body or potential admitted body has to decide if it wants to jump through all those hoops to get in. The second type of employer we have here, these transfer readmission bodies, these are where you outsource a service, say, and you are going into a contractual arrangement where actually if, if everyone agrees then you would let them in. If the, if the new employer that was taking on the staff wanted to come in as an admitted body, the, or the say, Dumfries Council was happy to allow that to happen. There's certain requirements that need to be met, but then you'd bring them into the, into the fund uh, for those, those employees. So, again, that's just to show that it's not just a single council uh, fund. It's got a multitude of different employers that can actually be part of the scheme. Just a question to you, Chair. Have we ever been approached, Paul, as a, as a council by any, either of these groups, uh, types of groups, community admission bodies or transfer admission bodies, to join our scheme? We do have an, a number of scheduled and admitted bodies. The, the information I think you received in the annual report last week, which was issued at full council, actually lists all of the admitted bodies and scheduled bodies that are part of the, the LGPS in Galloway. So there is quite a number of those. 
And you can see I've read it thoroughly. The next few slides are just to sort of, without going through every single piece of detail, just to sort of summarise the roles and responsibilities that you either have for the committee or officers or the pension board. So this is just looking at the, at the, uh, the role of the committee itself, itself. A lot of this, hopefully, will be stuff that would have been made aware to you when you were <laughs> taking on the role. But obviously there's a lot around funding and investment. That's a big issue that, that then generally gets picked up by the pension committee. Uh, as far as your objectives, your beliefs, what your strategy is going to be, appointing your managers, all of those tasks would fall to yourself within the pension committee. Uh, you, you're essentially, essentially sort of signing off your, your triennial funding valuation to, make, to say that you're happy with the results of that. Various publications that I've mentioned here in terms of statement of investment principles, funding strategy statement, they're, they're, they're two key documents that you need to have in place in order to deal with both investment decisions and also to deal with evaluation. But the last one, as I've mentioned before, and it often gets sort of overlooked when it comes to the committee, but while I come from an admin background myself, I might, I might have a vested interest to promote it, it's just not forgetting the point that you do have that responsibility to, to make sure that the administration of the scheme is sound and proper. The bit on the side is important too. You're not making employer decisions. You're making decisions on behalf of the fund. And as a fund, you represent all of the employees within the fund, not just a single employer or a single interest. And that's another important point that is possibly worth making too. Just for members, I, mean, I think this is a key page in the presentation in terms of this effectively is the role of, of this committee. We've just agreed to the remit. Uh, for the committee, but this puts a bit more detail in terms of the key functions, the key responsibilities attached to this body. And there's an awful lot of detail that sits behind that. That's just a list. <laughs> there's an awful lot of work that goes on uh, sitting behind that. In terms of the, the Section 95 officer. So I've just Sorry. got a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's just on that uh, comment, does not make employer decisions. Uh, so, so what's the status of? whatever decisions this committee makes regarding the other employers that are involved in the scheme? Well, you're making decisions on behalf of the fund. So, so if, if for, for example, there are, I'm trying to, to describe it, there are discretions within the scheme. There are employer discretions, and there are, so allowing someone to go early anywhere else, or like an early retirement redundancy decision and whether they're going to get their benefit out of the scheme. That's, that's an employer decision. It will have a policy in place for that. There will be administering authority discretions as well around how the fund itself will operate. So it's making those decisions on behalf of... It's looking at the fund and all of the employers in its entirety, not looking at Dumfries and Galloway Council and saying, we're going to make a decision for the fund which is going to benefit that one employer, because it's the biggest employer, you've got to think of everybody that's there. Well, just a supplementary sort of query. I, the, the, the issue I was thinking about was where the fund might, or the, the, the investment group might think there needs to be a higher employee, I'm sorry, employer contribution. Is that binding on the employers? or is Right, it, uh, I'll come on to that one in a moment in terms of the, the, the valuation side of things because I think I think what what we've got there will answer that particular that particular question. Ian, did you have a question? Probably going back to the points that we made and going back to it, Stephen, the point he made earlier in regards to a potential investment committee, that's under the, the delegation of this committee. So is that because it talks about investments here, is that particular to this organisation, the Bruce and Galloway Council's pension committee, or is that a definition as per the actual legislation itself? That's a generic Okay, so just a description of what the how how you do it. You, so it's a delegated function. It's delegated through the the, the 1973 Act that Dumfries and Galloway Council, as the administering authority, can set up or can delegate the responsibility to a committee or, or or officers to carry out the function of administering the scheme. You can do that through having just a single committee. You can do it through having a, an overarching pension committee plus a, a sub investment subcommittee. 
You can put more responsibility on the officers for the role that they do. There's different ways in which you can do it. But ultimately, in terms of that delegated function, coming back to, the, to this committee, if you had a subcommittee making decisions, it would have to come back to this committee to make sure that you were still happy with those decisions that they were taking. They couldn't just go off on their own little journey. So I suppose the point with, with being on here and being on make part of the decision-making process, so we actually see fund managers will come to us and they'll present a particular case to try and take forward a portfolio, or sometimes we have to say, listen, you're not performing to a certain level, we'll have to get rid of you, and, and I've been in both positions, and it just because it touches on approving investment managers, advisors, and custodians who have been there, improvement the, the uh, uh, setting the investment strategy. But we go beyond that, and I just wonder if, if that was covered somewhere else. Just because Paul has said, listen, this is predominant, this is this is actually your remit. But I think it just it goes slightly beyond this as well. That's the only point I was trying to get to, and it's in regards to the particular investment, or does this cover everything? Is that what you're saying? Well, obviously you're going to have investment advisors as well in terms of coming to you and talking to you about the performance of your fund managers. So then you're, you, you, you are going to decide to hire and fire, depending on what the performance of, 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 of the managers that you've got are and what the strategy is. You, you may look at something, and, and I'm stepping into a, 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 an area I'm not an expert on, but you may take a long-term view. And no doubt Mel will pick up on that sort of later on, but you, you could have a long-term view. So although the performance isn't good today, you might say, well, actually, we think it's going to, in the long term, pay, di pay dividends. You, you, you'll you have different strategies for different types of investment. This was just to pick up on the, the role of the Chief Financial Officer as well, uh, Section 95 of the uh, Local Government Act 23, Scotland. While it's not necessarily linked exclusively to the pension fund or to administration or, or management of the, of, of the fund, it's that overarching responsibility that the, that the Section 95 officer has in ensuring the, uh, the good financial management of Dumfries, Galloway Council and all of its uh, various committees and, and financial transactions. So that, again, that's, that's an important role, an important function which sits alongside and supports the work that you're doing uh, within the committee as well. The Pension Board came in in 2013, well, as part of the uh, Public Service Pensions Act 2013. It's obviously this, this, this idea that it's assisting the administrative authority in its function. It's not a decision-making body itself, but it's assisting you in ensuring your compliance. So it's part of a sort of a policing role and a, a check and balance to make sure that everything that you uh, are doing, you're doing correctly, or making sure that you, you are doing everything that you should be doing. So there's lots of sort of uh, responsibilities that they have in terms of making sure that the function is being carried out correctly, making sure you're complying with the regulations, wider governance requirements. But also picking up on this Pensions Regulator Code of Practice 14. They should be making sure that everything that you're required to do within that code of practice is being covered through either the committee or officers and the pension team, making sure you're doing a good job there. What's interesting, when you go back to this slide and all of those responsibilities that the pension committee has, and they're very serious responsibilities that they have, there's nothing in there that says you need to have in terms of the regulation, legislation, so you need to have the required knowledge and understanding to carry out your function, and you're making decisions. Yet when you go to the Pension Board and the requirements within the Public Service Pensions Act, they need to have the appropriate knowledge and understanding to do their supporting role for you within the committee. It's a sort of, sort of sits slightly oddly there, but it's that they do actually have a, a statutory responsibility to make sure they have knowledge and understanding. So that's so it's just a question. I mean, this is since the pension board came into existence, if you like. I think there's always been a wee bit of a question as to, you know, just in terms of clarifying the roles because we sit together as a conjoined meeting. Yes. Um, so how well do we, as members of the pension subcommittee, how how well do we know how how we're complying with what the pension board is overseeing us? If you see what I mean, because we. we Normally in our reports, we don't actually see that, oh, actually, by the way, um, 
the pension board reckons you need to comply a bit better with this? You'll, you know, you'll so have lots of different measures. So, for example, you will have any internal or external audits that are undertaken of the pension function, which will which will demonstrate whether or not there's an issue around, say, administration. That that can come out from that. You can also pick up on investment decision making processes as well in terms of the, the, the manner in which those decisions are being taken. So, so you can get information from there. You've got the Pension Regulator Code of Practice 14, which sort of sets a template for all of the dis different areas that should be covered. So, for example, it will look at uh, internal controls. It says you need to have suitable internal controls. It will describe loosely what it would expect to see, but as an organisation, you should be able to prove that you've got the required internal controls in place. So, so that some of it will come out of, say, the official audit route, where it will pick up on issues of weakness that need to be addressed, and as a pension board, you can make sure that they are addressed. Either they're put right, or there's a reason why they are the way they are, and you can move forward. Or you can look at particular issues, like internal controls, and say, well, let's, let's see what the administering authority has in place and let's address those ourselves as the pension board and come back and say we think there's a weakness in X, Y or Z. So there's different ways, there's not one way of you, you're not going to sit there every, every meeting and say we think you're a bit bad at doing one thing or the other. It will come out of a programme of actions that you want to take forward. So you would have a plan of what you want to do as a pension board to address over the years. It could be you want to look at communication. You're coming into the valuation. You could be looking at your, your processes around data ahead of the valuation, for example. You could, you, yeah, it, yeah, so there's different ways you can prioritise what you want to do. Through self, Chair. It states at the bottom there, the board must have an equal number of scheme members and employer representatives. It makes no mention of gender balance. I thought that the Scottish government same was to have gender balance on all boards. I personally I couldn't comment on that because as far as the Public Service Pensions Act is concerned, it makes no reference to that whatsoever. The, the Public Service Pensions Act is an overarching piece of over, overarching piece of legislation that covers the whole of the UK. So that just sets the the framework in which everyone has to work. How everyone in Scotland wants to address that is a matter for Scotland, and then how England and Wales wants to address it would be a matter for England and Wales. This is the way Scotland's addressed it so far, but whether they want to review that further down the line would be a matter for Scottish ministers to, to consider. So I'd just to let members know that Paul's been called away to an emergency, so Gemma is going to, to set up here in the chair. This was just to sort of show, obviously, that how, how in terms of looking at how the scheme actually works. So obviously, you get contributions in, you, you invest the money, and then you pay the benefits out. It's all very simple, uh, but obviously, there's a lot more that sits beside it uh, than that. Am I going? I'm not going backwards. Do apologise. What I want to pick up on in terms of this, this particular slide here is just to show how the benefits are made up. And it's, it's really to make the point that the scheme hasn't sat still over the decades. It's, it's changed and, the, and the, the manner of the benefits has changed over the years. So you now have a scheme that's made up effectively of three parts depending on when someone was a member of the scheme, and they can have either one, two, or all three parts of those benefits within their scheme. So, uh, again, I'm not going to go into the sort of the great detail of the scheme, but it's just to show that from the administration sort of perspective, uh, it, it changed over the years, and uh, no doubt it will change again in the, probably in the near future, but uh, it certainly, certainly is uh, fluid. In terms of the employee contribution, employee contribution is set out within the regulations. Uh, it's, it's based on, on income bands. 
And uh, it, 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 the way it works in Scotland is different to England and Wales. In England and Wales, once you hit uh, the next band, all of your contributions are based on that higher contribution rate, whereas in England, it, whereas in Scotland, it's done on the basis of every pound you sort of pay plus like a sort of a graduated scheme that's been set up in Scotland. So it's a bit seems to be a bit more progressive and a bit fairer for the actual scheme members. So while you've got 12 bands, sort of five bands that get you from 5.5 to to 12 percent, there's actually a whole Excel sort of spreadsheet table checking out all the individual contribution rates. Tim, you got? Uh, has the final salary scheme been stopped altogether? That was the, used to be the best year of the last three. Yes, that, the, 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 the final salary scheme itself went in uh, 2015 and was replaced by the CARE scheme, the Career Average Revalued Earnings Scheme. So everything that people had within the final salary scheme was protected and is protected. So it's still based on the final pay when they come to leave at some future date. But everything they've earned from the 1st of April 2015 onwards is based on a, they, get, they get a pot of, of pension that they build up each year based on the pay in that particular year. And then that then gets increased each year in line with inflation. So what you end up with is a situation where you've got your final salary chunk done in the traditional way. And then in the care section, they've got these lots of individual care pots built up every single year to make one sort of larger care pot, if you like, which then gets added on top of the final salary bit at the end. So it's a defined benefit scheme in the way it always has been, but it's no longer final salary. Has, has it been calculated? Obviously that's got to take a great number of years to work out. But what, what's going to be the effect on the employee when they retire purely under that yeah, the scheme. The that's a difficult one to answer because because it the final salary scheme will always benefit those people who have an increase in pay towards the end of their career because all of their membership is then upgraded to reflect that final salary. A career average scheme is a more it gives a more sort of even spread of pension growth and entitlement over that period. So for those people on average pay, it makes little difference whatsoever because they're not getting those big peaks towards the end. Those higher earners who may have benefited from those peaks in the end, they're the ones who are going to be less well off. They're not going to be not well off. <laughs> they're just going to be less well off than they might have expected to be under the final salary scheme. So it's a, it's a small proportion at the top who might be adversely affected, negatively affected. Uh, the technique used to be you got the uh, promotion in the last year or 18 months, yes, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, so you stopped that. Stop that, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jim. Thanks, Chair. We are now entering a period of higher inflation. If you're operating on a career average scheme, are you therefore disadvantaged if the inflation level is high? At the, well, the, the, the career average scheme will, will, it, will rise with increases in inflation anyway. So each year that you earn, it increases in line with inflation. Where the career average scheme currently has been a benefit for the member is the fact that you're in a period of low pay growth. So actually, the career average scheme is probably providing them with a better benefit for those years than they would have got under the final salary scheme because they're, they're earning a pension pot based on, say, 15,000, and then that's increasing by inflation, which is higher than salary growth. Whereas if that had been a final salary scheme, that would only have increased by the salary growth. So at the moment, it's not that it's not it's a difference between inflation and salary growth. If salary growth started to outstrip inflation in any big way, 
then people would, in terms of comparison between care and final salary, people would start to lose out at that point. But as it is at the moment, they're probably quids in. Right, so uh, employee contributions, obviously it's this, it's this graded system. Uh, there, there are various exclusions. I won't go into all of them, uh, but they're there in terms of the legislation, just to be, to be clear that it's not every single period of uh, element of a person's pay. Beyond their own benefits and their members' benefits, there are obviously other benefits there to, to be considered. But if, if we had this 50-50 option in the scheme now, whereby if people are finding it too costly to be in the scheme, rather than opting out and coming out of the scheme completely, they can pay half the contribution and receive half the benefit for that particular period. Just a bit more flexibility than they've had uh, in the past. Obviously, there's a whole raft of survivor benefits in terms of widows, widowers, cohabitees, uh, death grants, etc. So there's a whole range of benefits that are sitting there within, within the scheme itself. I appreciate that I'm probably taking far longer than we, we, had, we had hoped. But I'll, it's a, actually, that bit is probably quite important simply because that's, that's the background that a lot of people don't always understand, the context of where the scheme comes in. In terms of the next two sections, I'm going to try and whiz through these as quickly as possible. Valuations, why do we do them? Quite simply, we have to. The regulations actually say you've got to do them every three years. So you have to do them every three years. You're currently in a valuation year this year to work out the contributions for the next three years for all of your employers. Uh, you're also having this sort of uh, bit of a stock take to make sure that uh, the, the assumptions that have been set by your fund actuary and the reality, the actual experience that you've had over that previous three-year period, how closely aligned was it? Was it better for you? Was it worse for you? What were the underlying reasons for that? Was it within your control? Was it outside of your control? All of that will be discussed and considered as part of the valuation. Uh, so as it says at the bottom there, it's an exercise in risk management. Every three years you're seeing where you are relative to where you would have hoped to have been. And obviously then make the necessary changes uh, to try and get you back on track if, if, if necessary or to release the brakes if that's something which you were feeling you could actually do itself. There's a few slides here around the sort of the contributions and the, the investments and, and the benefits. But the, the key one here is the first point, the funding strategy statement. This is the statement that effectively sets out how you are looking to fund the benefits that you are going to be paying out of the local government pension scheme in Dumfries and Galloway. Key document, a lot of discussion with the fund actuary, should be discussing it with the employers as well to agree the basis. It, it, it sort of sets out, in answer to the earlier question, it sort of sets out that relationship that the fund is having with the individual employers. So if you've got an employer that has got a, a fairly strong covenant, you'll have an attitude to that employer that says, we can spread our risk over a longer period. If you've got an employer that you think has got a weaker covenant, or is a risk to the fund, you might say, we're going to spread our risk over a far shorter period for that different type of employer. So the funding strategy statement would be where you would set out that relationship with your employers, have that discussion with them, so they would understand where they sit within your fund. And that then drives the whole of the valuation process going forward in terms of working out the sort of the contribution rates that you want the employers to pay. In terms of investments, the key document here again is the statement of investment principles. That's setting out all your beliefs setting out how you want to uh, manage the investment side of the fund. It goes hand in hand with the statement, uh, a funding strategy statement, because the two together form the whole in terms of your attitude to getting the contributions in and what you're going to be doing in terms of investing that money. And these are the, the decisions that are going to sit with the pension committee to decide how it approaches both of those. And in terms of the, the benefits being paid out, while it, you don't necessarily do them yourselves, your pension team will be doing those, uh, those, those calculations in terms of anyone's entitlement <coughs> and making sure that the benefits are paid, working with your accountants to make sure that there's enough cash available to pay the pensions on, on a monthly basis. Got here around the discretion policies as well, just to make, make you aware that obviously that's something in terms of the administering authority those discretions come to you to decide any changes that will need to be made to those. So that's sort of a very, very, very quick 
whistle stop tour of, of, of that sort of side of things. In terms of the, the ultimate objective, this slide here, I'm just going to probably go over this one. This is just sort of setting out how different strategies would, would potentially affect how much you would expect an employer to pay. So you will have a discussion, or there will be discussions going on between officers and the actuary in terms of what sort of asset returns you're expecting to receive. Those asset returns will then determine how much extra money you think you're going to need to get from your employer. If you've got, and the, the extreme on the left-hand side is basically saying if, you, if you're expecting to get nothing back from your asset in terms of your investment, it's all going to fall on the employer to pay. Obviously, that's not the way it works. You'd expect to get some returns back and it affects the, new, the way in which you're going to fund it going forward. This is quite an important one which has moved on in, in recent years. Just understanding your employees is quite important to understanding the risk of the fund that you want to take. Not all employers are the same. And one thing that's happening for the LGPS over recent years is the, 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 the type of employees that are coming into the fund are far more varied than they've ever been in the past and that's just going to increase over time especially where larger organisations are breaking down into smaller organisations as well. So different risk profiles for different types of employers is an important aspect of understanding how you do your, your role as well. And then, as it says, what are you trying to achieve for each different one? Each one will have a different... Overall, you've got a funding target for the fund, but within that you'll have different targets for your different types of employers depending on what sort of employer you've got. It's just sort of understanding that as part of, of, of the valuation process. This is just to try and explain when it comes to valuing a single member that you have a period of contributions that you're paying over a number of years or, or receiving over a number of years in terms of employees and employers. When that person comes to retire, you're still saying 65, but obviously it'll be depending on <laughs> what their circumstances are. Uh, there'll be that big peak in terms of paying out the lump sum that you pay out to them that might be due. Then you've got that gradual increase in the, in the member's pension over a number of years. The member dies, there might be a survivor's benefit that then follows on from that. Just to make the point that a single member's lifespan within the fund can be massive, you know, many, many years. If you, people can come into the scheme now 16, and then they can live till, well, yeah, well into their 80s, 90s, even in uh, centurions within the, within the scheme will be from all the time. That is a long relationship that an individual member will have. And part of the valuation is to value that member's benefits from start to finish so that at the end, ultimately, when you come to this one, as the last payment is made, the fund sort of ceases. That's the ultimate objective, is to make sure there's always enough money to pay that benefit so that right at the end, there's no money left and no one's owed to the fund either. Comments here. That young lady there took a look at everybody sitting around here and worked out how long they've got, I think. <laughs> That's what happens in our industry. We tend to look at people and think, well, oh, you know. <laughs> in regards to that last slide and how it just pans out, something I've always struggled with, with a wee bit, because we have liquid asset and we have investments, which is, has a, a value as well. And we pay out cash in real terms as a pension to the the members who, who have got to that point in, in life where the, that's realised. Can you just, just go over again in regards to what we've got in liquid, how that's paid out and our actual investments as well, the difference between the two and how they work. Is that an appropriate point to ask this particular question? Or is it maybe better on later on? Just, just when I see that last, it just <laughs> triggers that question for me. Um, I suppose as your team would mature, you would, you would consider that as part of your investment strategy. So right now, because um, you would make sure that you had enough cash and liquid assets and assets that you could sell um, in short term, short term, so assets that are listed in the stock market, for example, um, to meet those benefits. As a scheme matures, typically you would um, look to sell down your more liquid assets, so property, things like that. You would um, come up with a drawdown program, so you would gradually receive all the income back, or you would sell down units as there were opportunities. Um, so you, you would plan for that in advance, and you, as part of your valuation, you would be looking at um, your expected cash flow over the next few years. Um, so as I say, the, the investment strategy that you're setting should be looking forward and taking that into account. 
So say the last day that your pension's paid, you shouldn't have any assets in um, property or um, infrastructure or assets that take a long time to sell or can't be sold on the public market. So that's pretty tough. Am I back again? Oh. <laughs> so a, a, a bit like the, the Icelandic situation a few years ago, if everyone had been invested in Icelandic banks, suddenly it would all have gone horribly wrong. This is to make sure that you can't invest everything uh, in one place. So these are uh, apologies that the, the it looks nice on my screen here, but the light blue at the end looks a little bit too uh, watery on the actual <laughs> screen itself. But this is to just try and sort of set out in terms of when you're looking at the, the investment side of things, uh, what the sort of things you need to uh, consider and have a clear uh, sort of view on. So you need to have a, a good idea as a, as a committee in terms of what your investment beliefs are. What, what is it that you're looking to achieve and how do you want to achieve that? You need to have clear objectives on how you're going to get there. So you need to have a plan. It's very important to make sure that, that you are planning this over the medium to long term. There will be some short term issues as well, but just making sure that everything isn't uh, just reactionary. You need to make sure that you have your strategy in place and the structure to enable that to happen. So th these are all sort of it's difficult to sort of know what else to add to, to what's written on the screen really. But it's just making sure that uh, obviously when it comes to things like governance as well, that if, if somebody if, if the auditors were to come along and start to look at the way the pension fund was was, was being run and the way in which the decisions were being made, you could show that you had ticked all of these boxes and you, you could demonstrate that you had everything in place. <coughs> and while, while it is a bit watery, on, that, on, on the screen to my right, the effective use of time is an important one as well, making sure that you're looking at the right things, not getting bogged down in some of the minutiae, which actually might not necessarily be of relevance for the actual day-to-day -day running of the fund. I've kind of mentioned it earlier on, but one of the things that will, will it drives the funding strategy statement, it also drives your investment strategy as well, is looking at this sort of, uh, the covenant of your employers. How, how strong are they? How, how, how much do you trust that they're actually, they've, they've got the money sitting behind them or they've got the guarantee sitting behind them? Uh, because that will determine very much the way in which you want to invest. If you've got employers that you think are going to be higher, higher risk, but they're in, in, in the fund, that, that will affect the way you, you, you look at investment. And as much as you might look at done through accounts and say, well, that's got a strong covenant, that's going to be that or some replacement that's going to be there for many decades to come, you can have a different view to them to maybe some of your community admission bodies where you're slightly more at risk of those ones actually defaulting. While ultimately the, if a community admission body were to default, that might not particularly mean a big sum of money. The fact is, it would then be spread across all the other employers in the fund to pick up that bill. So everyone would be picking up that bill. So just making sure that you're understanding the, the links between the investment strategy and the results of the valuation, the, the, the employer profile that you have. And the last one there, it's your view to risk. You'll have a view which will be different to say your neighbouring fund, but it's, it's what your view is, how you can actually justify that uh, is challenged. So it's just making sure that you have your investment beliefs in place. Quite important, really, especially if, if, if you're new to the committee to understand what they are so that you can actually make them real effectively. I don't know whether or not you have anything like that within the fund at the moment, but that might be something which you might want to consider if you don't already have some sort of formal structure of those up where those are. One of the big ones that's out there at the moment is around responsible investment. Just making sure that you have your policy in place to understand what it is. I'm not an investment expert, but I, I, my, my understanding is it's not just about uh, 
investing in green energy or anything like that, not that that's a bad thing, but it's making sure that you've got a strategy which understands why you're investing in, what you're investing in, and what if, if there's an issue with a particular investment, is it something that you want to try and change their practices, or is it something that you want to walk away from? Sort of understanding kind of what your what your expectations are. And the stewardship and governance point, going back to the point I made earlier, really, that, that, that it's important to realise in terms of your role that you are you are managing the fund on behalf of all of your employers and all of your active deferred and pensioner members. So you, that, that's, that's, that's your, your customer base, if you like. It's a, it's, it's a broad one. It's not, although you're part of Dumfries and Galloway Council, you don't represent just Dumfries and Galloway Council. You've got to make sure that you understand you are there responsible for everybody within that fund. That's quite a broad membership. And this is just a sort of set out in a way when it comes to uh, investments, there are different types of investments. Some of them will be defensive, which will protect your position. Some of them will be more sort of attack-minded in terms of the equities, which may have more risk to them. What it's just trying to describe really is the fact that when it comes to your investments, you need to have a broad mix. It's not all your eggs in one basket, as I said earlier. It's making sure you've got a broad mix, understanding what it is you're trying to uh, achieve, what, what the aim of that is, when to come into it, when to go out of it, when to review it. So that's really what that uh, slide is, is trying to sort of describe. And obviously making the point that there's lots of other things out there as well which will come and go as, as time goes by. So lots of different choices. Nothing will ever be static when it comes to the investments and what the choices are. And it's just going back to that objective again, really, just to make sure that uh, assets and liabilities all are married up. So when you're doing evaluation, you're not just looking at the, uh, the liability side of it, you're also marrying that up to what's going on on the asset side as well, to make sure that the two work in harmony. And often, certainly in my past experience, it was the asset side that people got excited about. They forgot the liabilities. Every three years, they seem to pop up and maybe understand that you need to review the liabilities a bit more often as, as, as well. And that really was a whistle stop tour of the LGPS. Andrew. Thank you, Chair. As one of the new board members, I, I'm interested to know about the risk tolerance. Was there an evaluation of the risk tolerance of the members of the past subcommittee and when are we likely to take a risk tolerance assessment of the present committee? The triennial evaluation uh, looks at or incorporates the, the level of risk which the committee are happy with. So basically when we're, we're looking at evaluation and we're looking at how we're going to invest the assets, we we get we tend to we advise from Hyman's about various asset classes, what risks involved in these classes, etc. And then we try and pull together a, a strategy which gives us an element of diversity within an acceptable level of risk. So it, it sort of follows a, a, a pattern following on from the valuation where we'll come along and say, this is what's required, the valuation will say, this is what's required from our assets. This is what we need to ensure that we've got a, a regular steady contribution rate. And to achieve that, we've got to look at our assets, they've got to look at the risks, it's a, there's, I mean, there's a higher risk involved in investing in equity than there is in, in gilts, which was shown on the, on the slide there. So it's a case of determining how much money goes into equity, how much money goes into the, the bond side, how much goes into property. Uh, uh, you see, I mean, the, the level of risk involved in each is different. 
and creating that balance. So it, it getting a, a presentation from Hyman's uh, as our current investment advisors to say that we can do this, we can do that, we can do something else, and for the committee them then to say if they feel happy with that level of risk which is being uh, put forward for that uh, investment strategy. Yes, no, I appreciate that part of it. But those making the decisions also have their own level of risk attainment within them, each individual. And it's about how can we make comparisons from the past to the present so that as a board we can, we can make our own decision on whether they, they, they're maybe a higher risk uh, subcommittee that we've got working here than the past subcommittee. Yeah, Ian. Thanks. I mean, I just I think I see where Andrew's coming from because as a, as a as a member of the committee, we've made a lot of decisions over different investments over the last uh, last uh, number of years. I think seven or eight years I've maybe been on it on and off. But I think originally, as a my own individual preference was probably probably to be more of a risk taker. But through training and and experience on on the committee, such like certainly so you've got your active. I would probably follow more of an active uh, portfolio manager, but now certainly more lean towards passive. Because the return on the long term, which we certainly look at from a, a committee's perspective, passive, I would think, is far more secure and far more reliable compared to the active managers, unless you've got to play the, the, the short game, which we don't tend to do within this committee. But I, my, so my own perspective, from being more risky, I would, I would certainly would have took more risk early on compared to what I do now. I took, I would tend to promote more passive managers, like Saligo in general, and so on. I personally think it's important to, to have a bit of both. You know, we want to have the short term gain, but as well, the, you know, the, the long term plan in there. So, you know, I would agree with a, a lot of what Ian said. I don't know if you want to add anything, Andrew. Uh, well, Ian was talking about there with the passive and active. I mean, that tends to fall within asset classes. Uh, obviously, with, with the passive element, uh, where we're moving with towards equities. The, the passive manager will replicate the market and won't uh, bring in any additional element of risk to try and outperform the market. But you still have the underlying risk within the equity market. So it, it's a case of getting a balance between the asset classes and then how you actually manage within that asset class. So there's Within equities, you've got passive and active. And within bonds, you've got passive and active. So, but underlying all that is the fact that within equities, you have a level of risk. So even if you're passive, if the equity market goes down, the value of your assets will still go down. Is there any other questions? No, well, I think I uh, would like to thank Pete and uh, and Hymans for that um, report, and thank you for uh, for your timeliness. Uh, are our members happy to proceed to the recommendations to note the presentation and report from Hymans? Okay, we now move to the next um, item of business, which is the annual training plan and, and record. We have uh, three recommendations here, but I think first of all, I'll, I'll pass and just for, for a wee update on this. Uh, so this report is just outlining a proposal to introduce a formal training plan uh, for both the subcommittee and for the board. Uh, historically, we have always undertaken training, but to ensure full compliance with our governance statement, then we should be uh, recording this formula formally. And the intention would be to have a log of training that would be reported to future meetings of this committee as well. Elaine? Just uh, wondered, Chair, um, whether any of this training could actually be done online so that members are able to actually fit that in with the rest of their schedules and at work in this place. Uh, yeah, the pensions regulator training is available online and we'll be distributing the link for that. Um, the pension information pack will also be an online resource for members as well. The, the other event, it really is as and when they come up and when there's a need identified, uh, a lot of them do uh, take place in, in the central belt predominantly. They're delivered by some VAL fund managers and things. So 
uh, those ones, it, it won't necessarily be possible to, but we can usually get the materials and things as well, and we'll, we'll try and sort of add those to the online resource. Is there any other questions? Okay, so we'll proceed to the recommend. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Just to make a point, not a question as such, uh, one of the uh, board members uh, comes from out with North East and Galway Council, come from the college. Is there any uh, difficulties in terms of the training and the information that's available because they're not actually a council employee currently? Um, there, there might be in terms of accessing the pension fund information path. So I'll look at that with our IT department and find another way of distributing that if that is the case. I think, Gemma, you were talking about the online resources, the first thing that the toolkit, and you were saying looking for the end of September for all members to complete that. Was that, was that correct? Yeah. Okay, so we'll proceed to the recommendations. Are members okay to agree the introduction and development of the annual training plan in Appendix 1 for the Pension Subcommittee, Pension Board and Officers? 2.2, uh, which is to agree to an introduction of an annual record of training, which is in Appendix 2, and to receive updates to future meetings of this committee. And 2.3, to note the development of the Pension Fund Information Pack, which is in Appendix 3, and is a key source of information for members of the Pension Subcommittee and Pension Board. Uh, 